Scene 142, take one. My name is John Collinson. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, and I've lived in Los Angeles for 35 years. I first knew about Al's Bar from my sister, and she was a trailblazer for me in many ways. She was four years older. She went to Scripps College, and that's 35 miles east of here. That's a long ways for a college student. This is probably 83 or 84, and she told me there was this great place called Al's Bar, and they have an airplane fuselage hanging over the front door, which I think I've seen a few pictures of, but it's hard to imagine that, what that would look like. But my fascination was stoked by that. By 91 or 92, when I first came down here, it was gone. There was a band playing here called Clawhammer. I was aware of them, and I had been at Pooh Bah Record Store, and they had covered in entirety the entire first Devo record, Are We Not Men? I was like, what kind of band would do this? What kind of misfits would do this? And then I noticed on the back they had Mark Mothersbaugh review the whole album in depth on the liner notes. I was like, wow, well, this, this must be good. So I came down here to see the band play, and I was absolutely captivated by them. The avant-garde, Captain Beefheart-inspired blues punk band. I'd seen nothing like them ever before, or been to a place ever like this either. Well, it was a gritty clubhouse for creative misfit weirdos, and basically anything went here. Anything could happen. It was a wonderland, and this was a really gritty area in the time. You know, it wasn't hard to find parking here, that's for sure. And it was not a place that people went other than people that were in the know, artists and musicians. This was like, for me, the closest thing I could find in New York City. The parallels between Al's Bar and CBGB's are pretty similar. These places that fostered uh, creativity and inspired people to do crazy things and sort of a wasteland area that no one would ever go to. I immediately felt at home. I knew no one here. I came by myself and I was like, wow, I have a new place to hang out at all the time. I started playing in bands. Al's became a real creative outlet. Any band could play here, basically, and I think they had music seven nights a week. And you might start on a Sunday night, and if you got a little better, you play on a Monday night or a Tuesday night, and after a year or two of playing, your band got better. Uh, we play Friday or Saturday nights. My first band was an instrumental sort of a King Crimson fusion band, and we really weren't a good fit for Al's Bar. We ended up playing with a band from Portland called the Dharma Bombs, which is about as artistically different as you could be from what we were doing. And, you know, it didn't really matter. And they liked us, and they had us back, and we ended up playing with a band called Bazooka, okay, a rock and roll, hard bebop, jazz band, Black Sabbath, really great band. The bands we played with were all completely different and inspiring. It was more about performance art sometimes than actual musicianship. We had a gig one night with a band called the Imperial Butt Wizards, and it sold out that night. And that didn't happen with our band that often. We, we had a small following, and our friends couldn't get in the door that night. So we played our set, and then the, the Butt Wizards show up, and there's a guy in a Gumby outfit, and the rhythm section is putting on gas masks. And I was like, well, that's a fashion statement. And then, I, and then I realized it wasn't just about fashion, it was function, too. They started lighting plush animals on fire, smoke bombs and a road flare. After about 10 minutes of this, I was like, this is fantastic, but my body was telling me I needed to get out of here. It was toxic in here. The club was so upset with the, with the Imperial Butt Wizards just because they were trash in the place. And I remember leaving, and the doorman was so mad, and you know, we never made much money here. He gave me $400, which is an unheard of amount of money for a band playing at Al's Bar. I'm like, but we didn't really deserve this. And he's like, just take the money, just go, just leave. He did not want to pay the Imperial Butt Wizards. And I was like, you know, $400, that's a month's rent right there. I'm, I'm, I'm taking this and leaving. I, I can't remember if I share that with my bandmates or not. <laughs> I think a lot of bands cut their chops here and actually got better solely because the sound system was so bad. You could never hear what you were doing on stage. It made you a better musician. If you could make it through a gig without hearing yourself play and having the confidence to do that, you would become a better musician. You 
had to tap a deeper strength inside of you to perform. This was a training ground for all of us in, in many ways. I think most sound guys were kind of surly through that whole era. Hey, I can't hear myself. Go fuck yourself. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and you couldn't rely on the sound person to really give a fuck about what your, your concerns on stage were. That club, the Coconut Teaser in Hollywood. They had the shortest ceiling on stage, and there was a drum riser, and the sound guy would be like, let's hear it for Leather Hyman. Give it up for Leather Hyman. They're great. All right, you maggots, you have 15 seconds to get your shit off stage. And there was a steel girder right above the drum riser, and, I, and they had hot lights, and I would always stand up and hit my head on that thing and then see stars. The sound guys pretty much everywhere were hard to deal with. Leather Hyman was an interesting band. The name turned a lot of people off. <laughs> we were an anatomical, we were a Jewish biker, and Heather and Lyman were the principals of the band. It was a spoonerism. One of our friends said, instead of Heather and Lyman, they said Leather Hyman, and that just stuck is the name. That got us a lot of press. People thought we were some sort of weird, perverted metal band or something like that. We were firmly rooted in meat puppets and Velvet Underground. The thing that was most distinctive about us was that Heather played viola. She had an electric pickup on it, an amplifier, and would play that through a wah-wah. And we had all sorts of interesting sounds with that combination. It was a Friday night, 94 or 95, and we were the first band that night. Our bass player was a social worker who worked with uh, vulnerable children, and he brought along one of his clients. He may have been 18, I don't know, but he had this kid with us and we just loaded all of our gear in and he just walked in the club with us and we set everything up and then I didn't know what happened to him and we started playing. I tossed a drumstick at one point, I dropped it and I was like, ah, and all of a sudden this drumstick comes out from behind the bass amp and this arm hands me a stick and I keep playing. And at the end of the song, they pulled the power on us and we're like, what's going on here? You know, we're kind of upset, indignant about it. They knew there was a miner in the club, they couldn't find him, because he was hiding behind the bass rig on stage. So they kicked everyone out of the bar, including the band, and we all had to be ID'd to get back in. And I was like, this is a fucking police state. And Lizzie, the bartender, she was just seething and started screaming at me. We got back in, we were all ID'd, came back and finished our set. And at the end of the night, she was yelling at our manager, the always fabulous Tequila Mockingbird, Leather Hyman will never play at Al's Bar ever again. And, you know, we were a little disillusioned. Everything passes with time. You know, we didn't think we'd be banned forever. And Tequila calls me a few days later and she's like, guys, don't worry about this. I've got it all worked out. I've got six shows booked for you at Al's Bar in the next 10 weeks. And there's just one caveat. Your name is now Naugahyde Maidenhead. So, like, okay. And we made flyers that said Naugahyde Maidenhead on it. And our friends all knew about it. We probably played three shows under that name. People would show up and the bouncer would ask you when you paid, who were you there to see? And then he'd keep track of who attracted who and then would pay bands accordingly. And people were showing up saying, I'm here to see Leather Hyman. That went on for the three shows we played, and we just thought that everyone knew about the gag, and we had just moved on from that. And that particular night, Lizzie, the bartender, she found out about that and felt that she had been conned, and she exploded again. It was like, Leather Hyman will never play here again, again, you know? I think that was the end of it for us. I don't, I don't think we ever played here again after that. That was a certain sense of satisfaction knowing that we were banned from a place that didn't ban anyone. Yeah. Al's Bar was really ground zero for interesting creative music. Such a wide variety of bands would play here and it wasn't like one night was rock night, the next night was art rock night. These bands were just thrown together. The bands I remember coming down here to see and some of them we played with, Backbiter. <laughs> I saw them do the whole Tommy soundtrack here, which was extraordinary. 
Waco, the Wild Acoustic Chamber Orchestra. Because they had strings, we were simpatico with Leather Hyman. Bottom 12, which was like funk, punk metal band that had two drummers and a horn section. They sort of bordered on cop show music. They were fantastic. And then there were bigger bands like the Dickies, played New Year's Eve here. See Mike Watt play here all the time. And traveling bands came into town too, which was always a treat because it was like, they were coming to your living room. You know, this place was kind of a clubhouse. Owls is much missed. And thank God that this underground spirit still exists. We're all getting older. I didn't think I'd still be playing in these bands when I started this 25 years ago. Los Angeles has changed so much in this time since Al's closed and everything's commoditized and polished and spiffy. And there's this really creative underground clique of people that do amazing things and, and just for art's sake, you know, there's no money in this or anything. We, we don't know how to do anything else. We're the Golden Ruler. Having the Al's Bar reunion show here a couple years ago was just such a treat. I never thought that I'd come back into this place. actually see it with the lights on and, and kind of tidy in a, in a clean bathroom was something I would didn't think was possible. There were times there weren't doors on the bathroom here, I think. What a wonderful time and place. I don't think it can ever be recreated. This was kind of a wasteland. Like you think about things like, okay, where can I park my car under a street light? I wouldn't say it was a dangerous area, but it wasn't like it is now. You had to exercise caution. I do remember, though, after a gig one night here, we're out on the sidewalk, and it was probably 1996, there was a feeling that the neighborhood was changing. It was raining out, and this, the biggest, blackest BMW pulled up to the building across the street, and it had tinted windows, and it pulled in there, and we just all kind of looked at each other. This is the end of Al's Bar. This neighborhood is changing. And it was a sad night, I think, for all of us. Our misfit playground was threatened. You know, that's life, what are you gonna do? Within five years, Owls was closed and the gentrification process started. You know, they call this an artist district and I don't know how many artists live here. Illustrative of this was at the Owls Bar reunion concert a couple years ago. It started, what, two in the afternoon and everyone was outside in the afternoon in between bands playing and there was a huge group of people and two cop cars showed up and the neighbors were complaining about the festivities going on and people may have been clandestinely drinking beer or smoking what is legal marijuana now, but this was all a feel-good event and people weren't obstreperous or vandalizing anything. It was all very polite and the fact that the neighbors were complaining about it, I was like, okay, this, this isn't good. Striking closer to home, uh, downtown rehearsal at 7th and Santa Fe. I've been a tenant there for 25 years and they never owned their building. They leased it and it's a crappy area over there. There's lofts and stuff, but it's still not a place I'd want to walk my dog. The studio lost their lease and Soho Club. And we're gonna take over the building and make like a little boutique hotel and social club there. And you pay a couple grand a year to go have a minimum bill of $400 every month in their bar or something. And what really upset me about this club moving in there was supposedly they were marketing it as a gritty street experience for their members who typically hang out in West Hollywood. And, you know, there's a strip bar across the street, and that was part of the game. Come hang out in this gritty area, but it's our area, and it's safe, and you can do whatever you want. Definitely not cool. For a band trying to find a place to rehearse in this town, it's becoming almost impossible. And you know, It's just real estate so expensive. It is not the artist district anymore. No one can afford to be there. This commoditizing of style, I find it 
depressing. I'm just glad that I had something super real like Al's bar. You can't take that away from me. Cut.